So you go going camping, in the fields and in the forests. What you know about it? Not much? Well ensure that your time in the wild is a good old time by avoiding these 35 humble beginner camping mistakes, such as mistaking clear water with safe to drink water. Water being crystal clear is not necessarily an indication of its safeness to drink. What makes water dangerous and disease giving are the invisible microscopic organisms such as bacteria, protozoa, parasites and viruses. Things we tend to associate with stagnant, murky, still bodies of water, but can and do exist in clear running water also. Taking chances with such waters can open you up to the risk of a whole multitude of debilitating waterborne diseases. Dysentery, giardia, cholera, E. coli, cryptosporidiosis, all sicknesses that will make it extremely difficult for you to continue your journey. A tactical retreat back to civilization may be required. So to eliminate all doubt, filter and boil all water gathered from natural sources, even if it is from a crystal clear running stream. If fire is not available for boiling, then micron membrane filters such as the Soya Mini do filter out 99.9% .9 of bacteria, protozoa and parasites, as well as general dirt. Chlorine-based water purification tablets are another option. You can put your mind at ease by packing all three. The means to make a campfire and metal containers for boiling, a micron membrane filter and water purification tablets. You will have an answer to everything. You'll never have to worry about the water problem again. A relaxed approach to drinking water from wild water sources can have extremely punishing consequences if you're not lucky. Not worth the gamble unless you have no other choice. Underestimating how cold it gets at night. Imagine it is an idyllic sunny day, 25 degrees Celsius, t-shirt weather. But as night falls and the temperature drops to 18 degrees, for example, that is enough for you to become painfully cold if all you have is a t-shirt and the bare floor of your tent. So pack your kit for nighttime temperatures, not daytime temperatures. A foam sleeping mat, a sleeping bag and an outer layer, bare minimum. Underestimating the absolute necessity of a foam sleeping mat. Those big old rolled up mats that you often see strapped to the exterior of campers' backpacks, those are not luxury comfort items. They are absolute necessities if you want to stay warm at night. You lose body heat to the ambient air, but you lose it a lot quicker to contact with the cold ground. The floor of your tent alone is not enough to protect you. You need the insulation that those foam mats provide. It is not optional. You see a person with a big old foam mat strapped to their backpack. That's an individual that understands the assignment. They'll be chilling tonight. They understand that this is the way. They're going to be sleeping good. Those external straps on your backpack, load them up with that foam goodness. Having just a sleeping bag does help, but they are not enough on their own. But a foam pad and a sleeping bag combo, now you're camping. Even borrowing your humble sister's yoga mat is a hundred times better than nothing in regards to the issue of warmth and insulation. Though ideally 1.5 centimeters thick, bare minimum. It is a mission critical piece of equipment. Not optional, it's a deal breaker. Where you choose to set up camp can also be a deal breaker as there are a few objectively bad places to set up camp such as near still bodies of water, such as lakes and ponds, as these are high traffic areas for insects, particularly mosquitoes, you will get eaten alive. Directly beside brooks, creeks and streams is scenic and magical, but can overflow in heavy rains. And the ground in those areas tend to have poor drainage anyway, so even light rain could pool and puddle around your tent, flooding you out. Likewise, beside flowering bushes, underneath flowering trees, or in amongst flowery meadows, is most majestic, but are also high traffic areas for insects. Depends if you want to be swatting away flies and wasps every five minutes. Another bad place to set up camp is underneath tall, skinny pine trees. Why? Well, they tend to run quite tall exceeding the canopy, their trunks a lot slimmer than other trees of similar ages, more likely to catch the wind, more likely to bend and break in high winds. They are also trees that naturally tend to shed their lower branches. Great places for finding firewood, not so great for sleeping under, as even a small branch can rip a hole in your tent. 
This combination of features makes camping under tall pine trees a bad idea. Lovely and pleasant though it may look, it is a high risk area. People do die from falling pine trees. Widowmaker is a colloquial term for broken branches that have got caught up in the branches of other trees. They are fall risks. They might take three months to finally hit the ground, might take three minutes after you've set your tent up beneath it. Widowmakers may also refer to entire trees that have fallen but remain propped up by other trees. Quite obvious to spot in a leafless, deciduous forest in the middle of winter, but not so obvious when obscured by a luscious summer forest with thick vegetation and canopy. So before setting up camp, check the area for widowmakers. The surroundings must be thoroughly inspected. Look up, look around, keep that head on a swivel. Also, check the area for dying or dead standing trees. Trees that have cracks, splits, holes, cavities, exposed rotting bark, leaning or trees that should have leaves for this time of year but do not be weary of them highly suspicious likely dead standing just rotting away on the inside waiting to bludgeon you people do die this way so camp location should be an analytical process it pays to be a fussy diva about it speaking of tents do not under any circumstance light a gas stove or a portable barbecue inside of a tent or under a closed off tarp people do die this way a lot of people die this way because it's an easy mistake to make no one is born with an innate knowledge of carbon monoxide all flames smoldering coals and embers produce carbon monoxide, an invisible, colourless, odourless gas that is extremely, extremely poisonous, undetectable by human senses. Having it build up inside of an enclosed space, such as a tent, is a potentially fatal recipe for disaster. A mild case of carbon monoxide poisoning is a debilitating migraine and extreme nausea. A severe case is death or permanent brain damage. So, no gas stoves inside of tents or enclosed spaces. People do die this way. But what if I leave the tent door open? And I hear you say, well, risky business, not advisable. Can't be playing games with carbon monoxide. It will kill you. Underestimating small cuts, splinters, and scratches. At the time, such things seem like a trivial matter. But that's exactly what bacteria want you to think. The bacteria would love nothing more than for you to give them all the time they need to settle into your wound, fester, and give you a full-blown bacterial infection. Something you'll have to deal with once you return to civilization. That's 45 minutes on the phone trying to get a doctor's appointment. That's a week's course of antibiotics. All preventable by taking a minute or two to dress the wound as it happens, no matter how seemingly trivial it may be. Consider that fertile forest soil contains more bacterial species than the unwashed mouth of your arch nemesis. Then the way forward becomes clear. Treat all damage to the skin immediately with antiseptics. Carry three different types of antiseptics septic in your first aid kit. Liquid, cream and wipes so that you have something for all ailments. Cover the damage to the skin immediately with band-aids or bandages to prevent all the dust and soil you kick up from getting into your wound. Treat the seemingly trivial matter as if it is urgent and you save yourself a whole bunch of trouble down the line. Easy life. Thinking that you can only experience hypothermia in winter near zero or sub-zero temperatures. This is not the case. You can experience hypothermia in 15 degree weather or 19 degree weather. Temperatures we wouldn't typically associate with being dangerously cold, but it all depends on how exposed you are and how long you are exposed for. Your body generates its own heat. Your internal core body temperature wants to run at 37 degrees Celsius. Hypothermia occurs when the environment sucks heat away from you faster than your body can generate it. There are two ways you will lose body heat to the environment. One is exposure to the air and two is direct contact with the ground with wet or damp clothes rapidly accelerating that heat loss process. A five degree drop in core body temperature results in mild hypothermia, painful cold and shivering. A 10 degree drop 
extreme hypothermia and danger of death. You do not need to literally freeze in a snowy barren wasteland to experience hypothermia. It can happen under the clear skies of spring. It can happen under starry summer skies if your clothes are damp. So the name of the game, and really your only defence, is to slow down the rate at which you lose body heat to the environment. This is done by insulating yourself with foam sleeping mats, sleeping bags, an extra blanket to line the sleeping bag, foil space blankets, layered clothing, thermal layers, staying dry, campfires, and staying well fed and hydrated helps a little too. It is as simple and as difficult as that. But those are the requirements. Solve the problem of the cold and you solve 90% of camping related misery. Also, it would be a mistake to trust completely in the temperature ratings of your sleeping bag. The comfort rating is quite subjective and not well defined. Comfortable enough for what? A full 8 hours of uninterrupted, undisturbed sleep? Fat chance. And the limit rating is the minimum temperature you will be able to tolerate without dying of hypothermia. At such temperatures, you will still very likely be painfully cold and unable to get a single wink of sleep. But you'd live. It's why sleeping bags alone are not enough. You need this, your trusty mat. All sleeping bags can be enhanced with thin blankets to serve as an extra liner. Sometimes that alone can be the difference between chilly and warm enough. Foil space blankets have on average an 80% thermal reflection, so laying on it or wrapping yourself in it could be a game changer in the extremes of weather. Consider them an emergency item, always worth carrying. If you are new to sleeping out in the wild, currently lacking in that first-hand experience of how much shelter you need for what temperature and what temperatures you can personally tolerate, it is better to have found yourself taken a little too much shelter and insulation than too little. And considering how light these additional shelter items are, a thin blanket to line your sleeping bag and a foil space blanket to fall back upon won't weigh you down. If you have the space for it, throw it in there. If you have external straps on your backpack, load them up. Think of yourself as a temporarily homeless person that identifies as a tortoise, then you will have the correct mindset. Underestimating how difficult it can be to get to sleep while camping out. Even if you have solved the problem of the cold, as far as your hind brain may be concerned, there may be nothing relaxing about the environment you find yourself in. You are sleeping on a significantly harder surface than what you're used to, perhaps running a little colder than what you're used to, head unpropped by the luxurious memory foam pillows that you're used to, you're in a new strange environment, nocturnal animals make noises that sound like somebody getting disemboweled, and the odd twig snapping in the middle of the night may lead you to question whether or not it's just a hedgehog or whether it's jigsaw. Being sleep deprived come morning is misery, so packing a few sleep aids is the camper's dirty little scandalous secret. Some take sleeping tablets, herbal teas, melatonin, 5-HTP gummies. Some dose themselves up on valerian root, earplugs if they're sleeping in open, windy environments, MP3 players, portable radios. Personally, choosing to sleep in a hammock rather than a tent, having a portable radio's quiet background noise, and binge eating half a pack of ginger biscuits right before shut-eye knocks me right out. We're sleeping good. You will have your own combinations, rituals, and dirty little secrets. Bring them with you. Allocate space and weight specifically for them. You will need all the help you can get, because being unable to sleep just means that the next day will be absolutely dreadful, especially if you have a long hike home or another day of camping. One of your goals as a camper is as the sun rises upon a new day, you ain't looking and feeling like Gollum, and that is easier said than done underestimating how quickly it gets dark. If you were to wait until the sunset to set up camp, you may find yourself running out of time. One last trip to the stream to top up on water and you've still got to set up your tent. And it turns out you've left two of your tent pegs at home. So now you've got to carve new ones out of wood. And you've got to build the campfire, which means spending time gathering firewood. Maybe your lighter doesn't work. Now you've got to do things old school with a ferrocivian rod. And time's up. You're in big trouble now, boy. So get all sorted and set up three hours before sunset. Give yourself ample time to resolve any issues and oddities that may arise. Better to do it sooner rather than later. 
Also, cheeky showers of rain aren't always predicted by forecasts, so the camping equivalent of make hay while the sun shines is to set up your shelter while the weather is good. Don't wait until the unexpected, unforecast five minute shower of rain comes along to do so, as your interiors will get wet during the setup which is a big problem once the temperature starts dropping come nightfall. Not checking the weather forecast is an easy mistake to make. You gotta check for that rain, those thunderstorms, the showers, nighttime temperatures, and also wind speed, as finding yourself camping beneath trees that are violently swaying back and forth in surprise 30 mile per hour winds is quite concerning. And if you're camping with others, then don't assume that the organizer will be checking the weather forecast. They may forget, they may be presumptuous. Similarly, don't expect the others you camp with to bring the lighters, the matches, and the means to purify water. They may forget, they might assume that you would be bringing them. So bring your own always, for peace of mind. Maybe you'll come in clutch. If, when checking the weather forecast, you make a note of the nighttime wind direction, then you can min-max by setting up your tent in a so-called arse to wind orientation. That's having the slender tail end of your tent in line with the wind direction for a more aerodynamic profile. Rather than having the broad side of your tent tank a rogue gust of wind in the middle of the night, creating a whole bunch of noise that wakes you up, denying you that precious sleep and moving you one step closer to Gollum. You can also set up your campfire accordingly, so that the wind doesn't blow the smoke into your tent, but rather away from it. Those little things can make a big difference. Getting wet clothes is a huge problem, whether it be from the sweat of exertion, getting caught in a shower or rain, or losing your footing and having one leg fall into a creek. As temperatures drop at night, those wet clothes will be your biggest source of heat loss. Cotton clothes in particular are notorious for retaining moisture. They take forever to dry naturally. Jeans are a popular clothing choice for camping as they are rugged and durable, but they are 100% cotton. So getting them wet is a huge problem if you were planning on sleeping in them. If your clothing is cotton, you just have to be more consciously aware of where you step and how you travel. You can't take the same risks as those wearing polyester or wool clothing can. Likewise, your socks will likely get damp over time just through sweating. If they are cotton, they will probably stay wet. And if you can't dry them out by the fire or change into a dry pair, not only will it increase the likelihood of blister formation, but it will also be a big source of heat loss. Avoiding cotton socks is the play. Opting instead for wool, polyester, or a wool polyester blend. Packing spare pairs of dry socks to change into over the course of the trip is absolutely mission critical. There is not a single person in the history of planet Earth that has ever regretted packing extra pairs of spare socks. But there are many that have regretted not doing so. Even if it is not forecast to rain, short showers aren't always on the forecast. So packing a light rain jacket in your bag anyway is a good idea. Even if it doesn't shower or rain, it's still useful as an extra layer of insulation for nighttime temperatures. And if it's not needed for warmth, it can be bundled up into a headrest. For easy sleep, comfort gains. Some campers take lightweight, inflatable pillows, some just use their raincoat. There is never a situation where a raincoat isn't useful. Underestimating how easy it is to completely lose sight of your camp. There are lots of reasons why you would leave camp. To fetch water, gather firewood, or run from the Wendigo. You sense that you haven't travelled too far, yet you turn around and your camp is nowhere to be seen, hidden behind all of the brush. You've lost all sense of direction. This is something you have to always remain consciously aware of. Look back often. Try and keep your campsite within view at all times. And don't stray too far until you know the forest well by its landmarks. That fallen tree, that pond, that stream, that birch tree, that widow maker. Not gathering as you go. While you're on your point A to point B journey, you spot some pine cones, birch bark, dandelion seed, fireweed or cramp balls, grab them. All these little things that are useful for fire making, it's best to pick them up as you come across them, rather than having to double back and potentially not finding them again, and saves you from having to venture away from camp and perhaps losing sight of it. May your pockets be filled by the time you reach your destination.
not adhering to the high and dry philosophy of campsite locations. Choosing to nest at the base of a slope or incline is a recipe for disaster, as those slopes will channel all of the rain down, and that water may start to pool beneath your tent, flooding you out. As an example, this location would be a terrible place to set up camp. For two reasons. One, it is at the base of an incline, so water will likely pull there and you'll wake up in a puddle. And two, you're surrounded by those tall, skinny pine trees, some already leaning. And look at those low-hanging branches. They're already dead, already ripe and ready to drop on your tent in the middle of the night. A stiff wind will snap those right off. Likewise, setting up a tent here, the flat valley between two inclines, if rain were to pull, this is where it would pull. So be conscious of the terrain. You want to stay high and dry, not at the base of any slopes. And if camping in open, flat, grassy terrain outside of the forest or in a clearing in the forest, then avoid mossy ground, as that is an indication of moisture, the soil having poor drainage. If it rains, you'll wake up in a puddle, flooded out, and that is a pain in the backside. Not packing a light source isn't a massive problem with ruinous consequences, but you will come to find that there are times where it's quite inconvenient to not have one available. It doesn't need to be a huge item, just a small flashlight or a headlamp that will allow you to see a couple feet in front of you when you get out of bed to relieve the bladder at night or find something in the bottom of your backpack. Even one you can fit on a keychain is better than nothing. Your phone might have a flashlight, but it may be better to preserve that precious battery life for emergencies. Not packing a spare cell phone. Your primary might get lost, misplaced, broken, damaged by water, or just run out of battery. Bad times if, God forbid, there ever is an emergency. A fully charged, cheap Nokia with its own activated SIM that stays in its own dedicated backpack compartment or zipped pocket puts your mind at ease. Not clearing the ground of twigs, conifer cones, brambles, sticks and rocks before you set up your tent. That's a good way to puncture a hole in the bottom of your tent, a good way to dent your spine when you lay down upon it. Sweep it all away before setting up the tent. Likewise, if you're making a campfire, clear the area of all leaves, twigs and debris. A safety measure to prevent the fire spreading uncontrollably and starting forest fires. Give the area around your campfire 10 feet of clearing. Think the length of a humble smart car. That may sound excessive, but consider that strong winds can push trees over. They'll have no issue rolling a smouldering coal a few feet across the floor. Some campfires are surrounded by a circle of rocks. That's most aesthetic and helps to keep the fire contained. But some rocks should definitely not be placed in or around the campfire. Those rocks are porous rocks, cracked or creviced rocks, mossy rocks, or soaked wet rocks, such as those pulled from a stream. Any rocks that are wet or have holes, cracks and crevices that can harbor and trap water, that moisture will become gaseous when it's heated by a fire. The gas expanding, creating a whole bunch of pressure inside the rock, which could eventually cause the rock to explode, sending sharp fragments of rock up into the air. Quite concerning if you happen to be sitting close. Mossy rocks are an indication that that particular rock has some ability to retain moisture, enough to keep the moss alive at least. So dry, smooth, mossless rocks only. Trusting in a single solitary lighter is bold. They can break, get jammed up, leak fuel, all of which will leave you flameless. Packing two lighters, matches, and a spark throwing ferrocerium rod as a backup will ensure that you will always have the means to get that fire lit. Picture this, it's the morning. You wake up inside of your tent after a warm enough, somewhat comfortable, good enough sleep. What little remains of your campfire casually smouldering away. What do you do? Pack up and leave it smouldering? No sir. Do you pour whatever little is left inside your bottle on it, say good enough, and then walk away? No sir. That's all poor campfire etiquette. You must ensure that your campfire remains are completely, fully extinguished and drenched before you walk away, as partially extinguished campfires can reignite, and then you have the death of a thousand burned alive animals on your conscience. It's bad times. If it means taking six trips to the creek and back to fill up your one litre bottle six times, then we're taking six trips to the creek. Or alternatively, you can pack something like an eight litre water bag that allows you to carry eight litres at a time. One trip, one fully drenched, completely extinguished campfire. That's good times.
All that should remain is a completely drenched, waterlogged, wet concrete-like slush. That's what you want. And once fully extinguished, turn the topsoil over, bury the slushy remains, cover and conceal the area with leaves and sticks, and no one will ever know you were there, leaving no trace of your shenanigans. That's good camp etiquette, Mother Nature approves. Sometimes sickness comes like a thief in the night. Maybe it's from dodgy water. Maybe it's from eating your trail mix with your unwashed hands. If you're lucky, it's just nausea. But it's very bad times if it's gastrointestinal upset. So packing Imodium in your first aid kit is a great idea. It won't cure the sickness, but it may delay the consequences long enough for you to figure something out. And paracetamol and ibuprofen makes headaches far less irritating and sleep depriving to have. The space and weight to problem solving ratio makes them incredibly worthwhile additions to a first aid kit. A better to have and not need than need and not have kind of deal. If not for your own sake, then for the sake of others, as something is bound to go wrong with someone, somehow, to some extent. And that's when the mobile pharmacy comes in MVP. Similarly, if you're in the business of building campfires, then pack some burn treatments, such as moist burn pads. If there's a campfire going, then assume that someone, somehow, is going to get burnt. Somewhere, to some extent. Burn pad is a good weight and space to problem solving ratio. It's no trouble to pack at least one. Should I cross this stream by walking over a log? No. Should I hop across these slippery, mossy rocks? No. Should I try and leap across this river? No. Should I walk out onto this frozen river? No. If all goes well, you save a couple minutes getting from A to B. But if it goes wrong, you're nursing injuries and dealing with wet clothes. High risk, low reward. That's not the play. Go the long way round. Take the scenic route. Some choose the way of the shortcut. Some of them end up in fail compilations. We honour their great sacrifice. But this is not your assignment. You are needed elsewhere. Your job is to get from point A to point B dry because you're carrying all the toilet paper. We need to keep you dry. It's mission critical. The thin tent pegs your shelter likely comes with as standard are just not appropriate for the extremes in weather. Extreme, as far as a camper in a flimsy tent in the middle of nowhere is concerned, being 25 mile per hour wind speeds and above. So considering your tent, tarp, hammock, whatever you choose to sleep in or under, is an essential piece of kit, then trusting a chopstick to prevent it from blowing halfway across the forest in the event of strong winds is bold. Grab some thicker ground stakes and pound them in there real deep. You can use the standard tent pegs as redundancies. Double staking. That's the play. Let's say you have your sleeping pad, your sleeping bag, an extra liner, and enough layered clothing to keep you warm at night. Then by this point, most of your heat loss will be from your face and head. So for cold weather camping, tactical sleep balaclava, that's the secret. One with a mouth hole so your breath doesn't condensate on the inside. If you're camping out in the open, you're a lot more exposed to the wind. So double stake your tent. And all of that wind banging on your tent makes for a noisy night. Foam earplugs solve that problem. The banks of flowing water, such as brooks, creeks, streams and rivers, that you would assume to be solid ground, may actually be completely loose soil and slosh that can sink you up to your ankle or your knee once you tread on it. Worst case, you lose a shoe to the suction, but at the very least, you'll be dealing with a wet trouser leg. A critical failure in those sacred moisture management protocols. Just something to be aware of before you fully commit your weight to any ground on the edge of a water source. Tread gingerly, leaving your trash behind at the campsite. This is not the manoeuvre, so carry a garbage bag in your kit and you can carry out all the trash that you brought with you. Wrappers, empty cans, bottles, don't just leave it on the floor. That's poor camping etiquette. You, my friend, have enough to worry about as it is. You don't want the forest to start having a grievance specifically against you. The forest has eyes everywhere. You won't get away with it. Respect the nature, tidy up after yourself, and you will be having a damn fine good old time. And lastly, if camping with others, then be the one that remembers to pack the toilet paper and the wet wipes. They may forget, but they'll be very glad you didn't. Is it possible to just ignore everything in this video? Grab a bag, throw whatever in it, go camping with no particular plan and have a good old time? 
Yes, but if you have reason to suspect that the universe might not always be completely conspiring in your favour, then it may be best to have a few answers to the common problems that many experience while camping. And those with a tale to tell of a time where you're done goofed while out in the sticks, do share so that we may all honour your sacrifice. Peace!